Hello, and welcome to the Complete History of Science podcast. Marking any particular point as the place where science starts is an impossible task. Science as we would understand it is a relatively modern idea. The words science and scientist were not widely used until the 19th century, and the idea of science as a career choice didn't become common until the 20th century. Nevertheless, the practice of science, as well as the ideas it produces, have a much longer history. A reasonable starting point are the early civilizations of the Middle East, particularly Egypt and Babylon, around 3,000 years ago. These peoples were amongst the first to go from nomadic hunter-gatherers into settled societies dependent on agriculture, marking the beginning of what's usually called civilization. This societal change was the key event in early science, as the changes in the makeup of society made the practice of science possible. It would also provide the motivations for these early societies to start pursuing science. For example, the dependence of these societies on agriculture was likely a particularly important motivator in the development of astronomy. This is because successful agriculture requires an understanding of a calendar, important for knowing the best time to plant and harvest crops. In Egypt, for instance, the seasons of winter and summer aren't particularly noticeable. However, every year the Nile would flood, which was crucial for creating the rich arable land around the river upon which Egyptian society was based. The Egyptians noticed that the brightest star Sirius was always invisible around this time, being as it was too close to the sun, but shortly after it would reappear and the flooding would begin. The Egyptians measured this happening every 365 days, creating the basis for a calendar which would prove immensely useful for early astronomy. This period of 365 days, the tropical year, could be verified using one of the earliest astronomical instruments, the gnomon. Gnomon, spelt G-N-O-M-O-N, is a simple device which would prove endlessly useful in early astronomy. In essence, a gnomon is a stick vertically set in a sunny place, which most importantly shouldn't be moved over the course of the day. The purpose is to provide some way to record the motion of the sun as it moves across the sky. By measuring and recording the shadow cast by the gnomon at some interval of time, a wealth of astronomical information can be worked out. For example, local noon occurs when the shortest shadow is cast. Likewise, the direction of the shortest shadow gives the position of celestial north, which lies in that direction. Similarly, by repeating these measurements over the course of a year, the changing length of the shadow allows us to track the date of the summer and winter solstice. The winter solstice, for example, is the shortest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere and corresponds to the point where the sun is lowest in the sky. Therefore, by using the gnomon to measure the shadow at noon over a series of days, the winter solstice matches the day where the shadow is at its longest. The period between two winter solstices, then, corresponds to a tropical year. The gnomon is one of the earliest examples of where seemingly abstract measurements taken over an extended period of time, produce some very useful information. Despite their achievements, however, the Egyptians were far outstripped by their neighbours to the east. The Babylonian civilization, centred on the Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq, was another of the early agricultural societies which sprang up in the Middle East in the second millennia BC. Like the Egyptians, early Babylonian science was intimately related to the need to keep a calendar which would help guide the annual harvest. However, this sophistication far outstripped any contemporary astronomy, and the knowledge they passed down was vital in the development of astronomy into a fully-fledged science by the Greeks. Indeed, many histories of science begin with the Babylonians, and this is for one very good reason. They left records. While it's likely that people have long recognised patterns and cycles in the motions of the stars. The Babylonians are the first people we know of who made methodical recordings of what they saw. Miraculously, these records, such as the Mul'apin tablets from around 700 BC, survive, 
and are preserved in the British Museum. The Mullapin tablets are probably the first extant object in the history of science which we might reasonably recognise as scientific data. The tablets record a list of the stars and constellations seen in the night sky. For example, the plough, Enil, who goes at the front of the stars of Enil, the wolf, the cedar of the plough, the old man, Enmesara. The Babylonians also grouped the stars into constellations and used this to divide the sky into 12 roughly equal proportions, corresponding to what we would now call the 12 signs of the zodiac. Over the course of the year, these constellations both rise and fall over the horizon as they make their way across the sky. So, the Mulapin tablets record a list of dates next to these risings. For example, On the 1st of Nisanu, the hired man becomes visible. On the 20th of Ajuru, the jaw of the bull becomes visible. On the 10th of Simanu, the true shepherd of Anu and the great twins become visible. This formed the basis of the Babylonian calendar, where an observer watching a particular constellation dip or rise above the horizon in the east can infer the time of the year. The dates correspond to dates in the Babylonian calendar, which was based on the lunar cycle. A new month matches the appearance of the new moon, and therefore a Babylonian month was 29 and a half days. However, this meant that 12 cycles of the lunar calendar was only 354 days in a year, 11 days short of the real value. This meant the lunar months would get out of step with the rise and fall of the constellations. The Babylonians weren't unaware of this, and eventually developed a complex system where a 13th month was inserted every several years to account for this. The Babylonians' real triumph, however, was in developing advanced mathematical models which could describe these observations. For example, As we discussed earlier, ancient astronomers could measure the motion of the sun with a gnomon, allowing the solstices and equinoxes to be measured. Naively, we might expect that there is an equal period in each of these four seasons. That is, there is the same number of days elapsing between the equinox and the solstice. However, this is not the case. For example, the time between the spring equinox and summer solstice is around 93 days but the time between the winter solstice and the vernal equinox is only 89 days. The Babylonians accounted for this by assuming that the sun moves at a different rate depending on the time of year. To achieve this, the Babylonians developed numerical techniques, specifically arithmetic progressions, which allowed them to account for the apparent increasing and decreasing speed of the sun. Even more impressively, they were also able to apply this model to the motion of the planets. Most of the celestial objects we've discussed so far, like the sun, moon and stars, move in predictable ways. However, the planet's motions are more complex. From night to night, a planet may seem to move across the sky in one direction, but then, occasionally, the planet will suddenly change direction and start to move in the opposite way, before eventually changing direction again. This is known as retrograde motion and gives the planets their name because the word planet derives from the Greek for wanderer. The Babylonians were able to apply their numerical sophistication to predict when these retrograde motions would occur. The natural question which arises here though is why the Babylonians should have been interested in the motions of the planets. Unlike the motion of the sun, which gives rise to the seasons, the motions of the planets have far less obvious utility. The answer lies in understanding that for the Babylonians, observation of the night sky was primarily about predicting what might happen here on Earth. Astronomy has for most of its history been intimately related to the practice of astrology. Even great astronomers such as Johannes Kepler were known to practice astrology as late as the 17th century. In the case of the Babylonians, the careful observations and recording of astronomical data were made in order to provide the best possible information to the Babylonian kings. The questions they hoped to answer were not personal ones which we might now associate with astrology, but questions of national importance. Would there be a good harvest this year? 
would now be a good time to go to war with a neighbouring city. For this the Babylonians created records of astronomical observations unparalleled in the ancient world. And they achieved this because theirs was a complex, centralised and stratified society. For example, one of the primary differences between an agricultural society such as Babylon and more primitive hunter-gatherer societies is that they produce a surplus of food. This allows for a class of people whose time can be spent on an abstract endeavour like astronomy rather than more pressing matters like food collection. Babylonian rulers invested in the state bureaucracy, likely some form of priesthood, which was able to spend time making and recording the astronomical observations. The durability of the state also meant that these observations were gathered and improved over many years, providing information which would have been impossible to collect within the lifetime of any individual. As compared to contemporary Greeks, the Babylonian astronomers were far more interested in quantitative and precise measurements because that was their livelihood, and the state funded this endeavour over many generations. And in the end, the Greek astronomers who followed relied on this Babylonian data for centuries afterwards. However, the role of the state was also a limit on how much Babylonian astronomy could achieve. While the Babylonians had immense success in predicting the motion of celestial objects, what they seem to have lacked is any theory at all underpinning the motion. In contrast, the Greek astronomers, who worked more freely and often with less data, preferred to philosophise on the nature of these objects in the night sky, and would suggest models without necessarily checking them against observation. In our modern conception of science, both of these elements are necessary. Models are theorised, which help us picture phenomena and offer some explanatory power, but these models then need to be checked against rigorous scientific data. Astronomy in the ancient world fell far short of this ideal model of science. However, many of the important elements which set the stage for the scientific revolution were already falling into place. While we may think of astrology as fundamentally opposed to science, the relationship is actually far more complex and subtle than they may at first seem. I think we can understand this if we consider that many of the same impulses which motivate us to study astronomy are the same ones which also lead us to practice astrology. The Babylonians saw the planets as either representations of gods or perhaps the gods themselves, but their astrology at least supposes that the will of these gods is comprehensible. While this is an alien idea to us, it differs from more primitive mystic thought, which supposes that the universe might be chaotic and unknowable. Astrology and astronomy are both founded on the belief that the universe around us is both understandable and predictable. As we'll see time and again, early science is frequently intertwined with religion, superstition and magic. To an early practitioner, there wouldn't have been any meaningful distinction to be drawn between these fields and science. The history of science, then, is in many ways the history of how we came to discard these layers of pseudoscientific thought until we reached a point where science could be regarded as a field in its own right. In the following episodes, we'll move westward to the Greek world, where Greek astronomy would emerge and slowly surpass the Babylonians, culminating in the work of Ptolemy, who would write the definitive astronomical work of the next 1500 years.